Thank you so much, Katie. I am not much of a traveler, but anytime I go somewhere, I have a problem, and that is that I'm a notorious overpacker, and some of you may fall into that group as well, and it's not merely that I feel like I need to have a change of outfits for each day that I'm going to be gone. I feel compelled to prepare for contingencies. You never know if you're going to spill mustard on your shirt or a drink on your pants, right? So you don't want to run out before the week or the the, the trip is over, so I'll, I'll be prone to have some extras. Beyond that, it's further complicated by this fact. It seems that before I go on a trip, I am absolutely incapable of actually planning out what it is that I'm going to wear. And so I have to take these things, I don't know if you're familiar with them, they're called options, right? And so if I'm going to be gone for three days, I may need six shirts, because I don't know exactly what I'm going to wear. I need some options. I've got uh, these pairs of pants, I I need some options in the mix. A lot of times that's not a problem. It's not a problem. But there are instances where that really does pose a challenge. For example, uh, the other year I had to go to Nashville for a conference and I was flying from Greensboro to Nashville and I didn't want to have to check a bag and so everything that I was going to take I needed to make sure it could fit in a carry-on that would fit in the overhead compartment. So I, I've, I've gotten out the clothes that I think I want to wear. I iron what needs to be ironed and I begin to pack and I realize, yeah, I'm out of suitcase before I'm out of clothes, right? That ever happened to you? Anyway, so uh, I've got more clothes than I can actually take and it dawns on me, yeah, all of this can't go. For me to get from where I am to where I want to be, I can't bring all of this. For me to get from where I am to where I need to be, where I want to be, I can't have all of this. Hold that thought for a moment and let me help frame up what it is again that we've been talking about for the past few weeks. We're talking about experiencing the boomerang effect. And by that, what I have and what I continue to mean is this. You can be someone here today who says, hey, I've got a personal relationship with God. I'm trusting in Jesus as the Savior of my heart and the Lord of my life. But you can very well, because of the choices that you make, get on paths that are leading you further and further and further and further from God so that where you are today and where you could and should be, You're very far removed from that. You can say, if you're honest, you know, things between God and I, they're they're very distant. They're very distant. They're not what either could or should be. And I, I need a return. I need this whole boomerang thing. Now, once that, that boomer, boomerang effect begins, once God has, has awakened this reality in your heart and he's motivating you to come back to him, get close to him, stay close with and to him, once you get to that point or, or that boomerang process has begun, one of the things that you have to come to realize is there's not room for everything as you come back. There, there's, there's some stuff, kind of like me trying to pack my carry-on, there's not room for everything. There are some things that need to go. So what is it for which there is no room for? Look with me in your Bibles today to Second Kings chapter 23. Second Kings chapter 23, and we'll drop in there in just a moment. But let me just frame up again the context as to what's going on. We're looking at this whole boomerang effect through the lens of the experience of this Old Testament king whose name was Josiah. Josiah becomes king amazingly at just eight years of age. Now, we had power camp this week and had a slew of eight-year-olds, and they may be qualified to play on a soccer team or basketball, but king, I mean, that, that's a big deal. But he becomes king because his father has been assassinated. By the age of 16, though, he begins to think and ask some big picture questions. He's starting to think beyond uh, just the, the here and now and the moment. And he's starting to ask questions about God and to, to try to figure all this out. So he's kind of beginning a spiritual quest, a journey. By the age of 26, though, he, he realizes this. The temple, this place that has existed for so long among us, it's in disrepair because we haven't paid any attention to it. We've been worshiping all sorts of other things and all sorts of other gods. Uh, We've paid no attention to this, and so it's in disrepair. He decides, you know, the, the very least we can do is try to fix up this place. So a renovation project begins, and what happens is that a copy of the Word of God is found. And 
what was amazing about that is that neither Josiah or the people he was leading had ever heard from it. They had ignored it for so long that I don't know that anyone even knew that it existed, much less this copy. And so Josiah is reading from these pages of God's Word, and it very much cuts him to the core. And all of a sudden, he realizes, I am, and the people I lead, we are very, very far from God. Houston, we have a problem. And he realizes, my behavior and the behavior of my people, it's putting us on the business end of God's judgment. We are not pleasing at all to him. We are actively angering him. And so after he's been exposed to this truth, we saw it in the opening verses of chapter 23 last week, and that was that he shared that truth with others. Once he's come to rediscover truth, he shares that truth with others. And as he does so, he tells the people this. He's read perhaps for hours from the pages of God's Word. And then he says something akin to this. I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm, I am choosing, I am committing, I am covenanting with God to be serious about this whole idea of following Him. There are things that He wants me to obey that I'm going to obey. There are ways in which He is seeking to lead and I am going to follow. That's what I am going to do. And so before God and before all these people... He makes that pledge. And you see as verse uh, 3 comes to an end, it says, And all the people joined in the covenant. That's where we left off last week. All right, so look with me starting in verse 4. It says, Then the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the keepers of the threshold, to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. Now, we'll stop there. We're going to drop in a few more places in just a moment. But what's going on is that after he has shared with the people his commitment to God, after they have joined him in that commitment, they are returning to God, Josiah realizes, you know what, there is not room for Everything, And so he starts essentially a nationwide house cleaning. And it starts at the temple. Which keep in mind, this is the place, the place set aside for the worship of God. And what does he start to do? It says uh, in, in verse 4 that he had them bring out of the temple all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. So Baal and Asherah are two idols, two false gods. And then it says all the host of heaven. These vessels that he's speaking of are the instruments used for worship and providing offerings and burning incense, all this stuff for Baal, for Asherah, and the host of heaven. So there is, throughout the temple, everywhere, there's all this junk that has been used in the place set aside for the worship of God, exclusively of God, all this junk for all these other false gods. And so what does Josiah do? He gets all of that stuff out, has it burned and the ashes dispersed? In verse 6, there was uh, an Asherah, which uh, kind of think totem pole, essentially. That was uh, standing in the, within the temple complex. In verse 6, he has that out, taken to the brook Kidron, burned at the brook, and beat it uh, to dust, and cast the dust upon the graves of people. So that goes. In verse 7, there were within the temple complex dwellings, or think apartments, I guess, within this sprawling temple complex, apartments for male prostitutes that were living there at the temple so that they could be used and offer their services as part of the cult worship of idols that was occurring. So all of that gets torn down. All of that gets destroyed and demolished. In verse 10, he tears down an altar known as, as Topheth. And it was there that human sacrifices among supposedly the people of God, even human sacrifices had been going on to the god Molech. In verse 11, there were horses that had been crafted, uh, statues of some sort that lined the entrance to the temple that had been uh, dedicated and were for the purpose of honoring the sun god. Josiah gets rid of all of that. And verse after verse after verse, it goes, all of this junk, Josiah gets rid of. Verse after verse. And as this junk goes, it leads us to our first application. 
If you're serious about returning to God, there's no room for everything. What needs to go? Well, if you're returning to God, you must, first of all, jettison ungodly things. You must jettison, get rid of ungodly things. The text gives us, and if you read the, the, major, or the first 20 verses of this chapter, you read all of the specifics of the stuff that Josiah gets rid of. And even though the particulars and the specifics are different, you could lump it all into one category. Josiah gets rid of everything that was ungodly or that would divert his or his people's attention away from focusing on God. So if it was anything that would detract people from ultimately honoring him, in this case, a false god, some other idol or some other proposed deity, all of that stuff he gets rid of. Why does he get rid of it? Well, because of this. It is difficult, exceedingly diff difficult, to be drawn away and tripped up by what no longer exists. It's difficult to get drawn away and tripped up by what is not even around. My wife Caroline has been on this diet uh, that she started, I guess, about the beginning of June. Some of you may from, be familiar with it. In short, it's kind of what, it's called the Daniel diet, and uh, essentially it's fruits and vegetables is what she's eating. And she's not like a vegetarian or anything because those people are weird. And... Um, <laughs> The plan initially was, I think it was for 10 days, two weeks, something like that, she was going to do this, where she was just eating fruits and vegetables. But she was doing so well with it so that she's kind of kept this going. And so uh, for the past couple of months, among other things, no meat. Uh, but thankfully, my wife is gracious because the stuff that she wants to eat, I'm really not interested in. And so what she so graciously has done at night is that she prepares something that she wants to eat and can eat and kind of keeping with this diet, but also is gracious enough to fix something for the rest of us so that we won't starve. And so during this time, we've had grilled chicken and fried chicken, and we have had lasagna, and we have had spaghetti, and we've had all kinds of stuff. And so Caroline is sitting there eating her, I don't know, curds and whey or whatever it is that she's eating. <laughs> so she, she's, she's got that while we're eating what is clearly exponentially better and far more delicious. And uh, we were talking about this uh, just the other day. She said, you know, none of that stuff bothered me. My weakest moment, and you may be surprised by this, she said, the weakest moment I had, the, the moment that I found to be so difficult involved Totino's pizzas. And I don't mean like DiGiorno, the good frozen pizzas. I mean like the 88 cent at Walmart Totino's pizzas. And, you know, that have about 11 sprinkles of cheese and those little funky uh, pepperoni bites on top of it. She said one day for, for, I was trying to figure out something for lunch for the kids and I knew that we had some of those in the freezer and I went and I got them, I put them in the oven and she said uh, it, it was just all I could do. And I don't know if you've ever had Totino's Pizza. In, in the realm of pizza, they're not that good. They are to pizza what McDonald's cheeseburgers are to hamburgers, right? If you're craving a really good hamburger, you're not like, hey, let me go to McDonald's and get a cheeseburger, Right? But still, there's a special place in your heart for McDonald's cheeseburger. It's kind of in its own category. It's, 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 it's just kind of on its own, it's good. Kind of unlike anything else. She said, Tatina's pizzas are just like that. And she said, I didn't have problems with anything else until I was cooking those. And all I could think about was that little thin, crunchy crust and those little funky pepperoni bites on top of it. And she said, it almost got the best of me. At my house right now, you will find bananas and tomatoes and lettuce. You'll find carrots and hummus and yogurt. You'll even find some ground beef and you'll find some chicken. But you know what you will not find? Totino's pizzas. Why? Because you cannot struggle with, you cannot be tempted with, you cannot be tripped up by what no longer even exists. So you say, well, what does this have to do with me? Yeah, he gets, I see Josiah gets rid of all this stuff. Caroline gets rid of the Totino's pizzas. But what does this have to do with me and me returning to God, getting close with him and staying close? What does this have to do with me? I recognize that 
in your home, it's almost certain you don't have some idol sitting around. You probably don't have a totem pole out in the backyard that you alter for your worship to. You probably, on the grill on your patio, aren't offering human sacrifices. Out in your shed in the backyard, that's probably not a dwelling for cult prostitutes at your house. I get that. And it's easy to say, what does this have to do with me? I'm going to tell you, a lot. This was the stuff that was tripping them up. What's tripping you up? What unwholesome or what ungodly thing or what is it that's directing your focus away from him that may need to go? Josiah got rid of everything that was ungodly. He got rid of everything that was, that was telling them, hey, this is okay when it's not. What in your life? Well, I bet the vast majority of us have some stuff on TV that needs to go. Some of you, I'm sure, have some shows that you watch on TV that you wouldn't watch if God was sitting there. Maybe it's a really popular show, a funny show, like Modern Family. Do you realize that's a show that does not subtly but overtly promote a lifestyle that is in direct contradiction to the Word of God? And in the effort to get you to laugh at it, prompt you over time, to begin to view it as normal, as okay. Maybe it's horror flicks that celebrate violence and gore and diminish the value of life. Maybe it's romance novels that captivate your attention and prompt you to think unwholesome thoughts. Maybe it's unrestricted internet uh, freedom and usage that keeps tripping you up with easy access to pornography. Maybe it's the home shopping network that is promoting and prompting materialism and covetous, covetousness in your life so that it's prompting you to be a bad steward of the limited resources that God has put into your hands. Maybe it's for you, not the TV. Maybe it's, we've been thinking about sports this week, maybe it's athletics. Maybe it's your commitment to a sports team that always and consistently has practices and games that are consistently in conflict with things that are related to the church. And consistently and regularly, whatever is going on with the sports team trumps anything that's going on at the church. It always supersedes your commitment to spiritual things. Maybe it's a hobby, whether that's fishing or painting or sewing, but something for which you're always amazingly able to find time for. But somehow, strangely, at the end of the day, there is just no time at all to be able to talk to God or read what it is that he has said and wants you to know. Maybe in terms of personal habits, there's something that's a regular part of your life that's harmful to your body. And God has been showing you time and time and time again that needs to go. But until this very moment, it continues to exist. I don't know what the particulars are that God is speaking to you and your life about. I know what they are for me. But what I am saying is this, regardless of what the particulars are, if you want to come back to God and stay and walk closely with Him, there's not room for everything. There is some stuff that's got to go. Now, if all of this is a game, if this whole idea of following Jesus just involves, hey, I show up on Sunday mornings and I, 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 I dress nicer on Sunday and I get up earlier than I would on Saturday and I just come and maybe I'll throw something in the offering plate or I'll help out with, with, with sports camp, I'll help out with vacation Bible school and I'll just be nice and I'll bow my head at the right time and I'll stand and sing at the right time and say, if all Christian living is, if following Jesus is just that, then take all the junk that you want. Bring all the immoral lifestyles. Bring all the destructive habits. Bring all the vices of speech. Bring all of that because it doesn't matter if following Jesus is a game. But if it is more than a game, if it is following a real God who has real standards for your life, a real plan and real purpose for your life, I'm telling you, based on what God has made abundantly clear, there's not room for everything. If you're serious, you've got to jettison some ungodly things. There's one more thing that Josiah does that's an application for us, which is this. It may sound rough. It may sound tough. 
But you've got to jettison ungodly people. You must jettison ungodly people. And verse 5, we're told that Josiah deposed the priests whom the king of Judah had ordained to make offerings in the high places at the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem. So what that's a reference to is that the kings who preceded Josiah, they had essentially created this whole school of priests whose job was to assist and promote, to instruct, and to make possible the worship to all of these false gods. And so Josiah goes to them and says, Guys, here's your pink slip. There's no room for you. You've got to go. So they are gone. In verses 19 and 20, in the regions of Samaria, that's northern kingdom, that's in Israel that has already fallen, it gets even more stern. The priest there, he actually executed had their bodies cremated and took the bones, the ashes of those bones, and sprinkled them on the altars that he had already desecrated and demolished. In verse 24, we're told, Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and the necromancers and the household gods and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah. The mediums and necromancers. Who are these? Well, these are people who purported to have the ability to communicate with the dead, to delve into and to operate within a dark spiritual realm. And so Josiah goes to them and says, Listen, there is no place for you among us. This is gone. You've had a place for a while, for a long time. But I'm telling you, things are different. And you've got to go. He kicks them out. What I'm saying is that it was not merely the ungodly stuff that Josiah got out of his life and of the life of his people. He got rid of ungodly people. People who would tell him and tell the rest of those that he led, the wrong is actually right. And all this stuff about God, it's okay to pay no attention to that. And so any of these people that would have influenced them away from God, Josiah jettisons them. They are gone. So where does this leave us? Where does this leave you? Does this mean, and am I suggesting to you, that God wants you to shun everybody in your life that doesn't operate, act, think, speak, behave, and believe like you do? Does it mean that I'm suggesting you need to only work in offices filled with Christian employees? Am I suggesting that you need to isolate yourself in such a way that you're effectively living in a bubble, that you've got a little commune and you have nearly no involvement with the world that's around you? I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying it all. This is what I'm saying. Hopefully you realize that every one of us, and if you think about what I'm getting ready to say, you'll say that makes sense. Every one of us has a very similar experience, which is to say, first of all, There are, even if you don't consider yourself to be the most popular person in Greensboro or North Carolina or America, the truth is all of us, in a very general sense, know a lot of people. In a general sense. And so our our lives, in terms of people, consist of these different circles. And in that big circle, there's a lot of people. And these are people that, again, we know in a very general sense. We, We know their first name. Half the time we can't remember the last name. But we'll speak to them. We'll engage engage in some polite chit chat. We may even be Facebook friends with them, but that, 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 that's about it. And that group is fairly large. Now, there's a smaller group of people that we know a lot better. We know their first names and last names. We may know even where it is that they live. We may, we may know something about where it is that they went to school and what their kids' names are. These might be, for example, classmates that you sit at uh, the table in the cafeteria at school with. This may be somebody that you eat lunch with regularly in the break room at work. But the, these are people that you know much on a much more intimate level, a much closer level. And that's a much smaller group. But then there's another group that's far smaller than that. You know, that, that second group, these are the kind of the, uh, the, the, the people that w- w- we would say, yeah, I, I kind of know them. This final group, these are the people that we know the best. 
These are the people who know us the best. These are the people that we're prone to spend some real and personal time with. These are the folks that we'll have over to our houses for dinner. These are the people that we may go on trips or vacation together with. These are the people when anything consequential in life goes on, whether it's happy and big and positive or whether it's terrible and tragic, they're on our speed dial that we want to call them. We've got to tell them. That group is comparatively very small. What I'm saying is, in particular, it is that innermost group that we have to absolutely and earnestly guard. These are, after all, the people who can and are most likely to influence us. These are the people whose lives we are paying the most attention to and those that we are most likely to pattern ourselves after. These are the people whose counsel we seek and those who seek to offer us guidance. These are the people who make suggestions about what we do. This group, if you are serious about following the Lord, if you're serious about coming to Him and staying close with Him, it is that group that absolutely of necessity has to be filled only with people that point you to Him. So what does that mean? In terms of application, am am I suggesting to you that There are people actively a part of your life right now that you need to tell them or not even say anything to them, but going forward to completely shun them and have nothing to say to them for the rest of your life. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying there are very likely people in your life with whom the nature of the... where the relationship of the present, if you're serious about following him, that relationship has to change. It has to, if you're serious. If you're a Christian teen who is dating a non-believer, that doesn't mean that you never speak to him, that you never speak to her again. But it does mean this. I am so committed to the Lord, I'm not going to have one of the greatest influences in my life, somebody that does not even know him. So that may mean that you have to have a painful, perhaps even tearful conversation where you say, you know what, I really do care for you. I, I may even love you, but who I love most is the Lord. And until we can get on the same page with that, our relationship has to change. It's not that I'm never going to speak to you again, but this whole boyfriend-girlfriend thing, that that for now is, is over. It may be for some older adults that that high school pal that you have stayed close to for years with now, that that relationship needs to change. And it's not that you never, ever speak to them again, but you realize, hey, we're not headed at all in the same direction, and they are very much capable and likely to influence you away from God, and that relationship has to change. They've got to go from that inner group. They've got to get into one of the more outer rings. I think I've mentioned this before, but uh, Caroline has a unique oddity, which is that she is very prone to pick up the accents of others. For example, and I, I can't remember if I shared this or not, but on our honeymoon, we'd gone on this cruise, and early on in the week, we had met this delightful pair of older ladies from, from London. And say what you want to about the Brits, but they have a beautiful accent. And I just love to hear them speak. And we just love he- just talking. These, they, they, were, they were funny. They were witty. They were just delightful people. And we spent a fair amount of time throughout that week with them. Several nights, uh, we would have dinner with them in the dining room. And one of the things that I noticed is that as the week progressed, the more that we were around them, the more that Caroline is starting to say things kind of strangely. And, and I say something to her. I say, what, what's the matter with you? Why are you talking like this? And she says, I, this is my disability. I, I, I don't, I, I can't explain it. I don't intend to. It just happens. But the more I'm around someone with this different accent, the more I'm prone to pick it up. I don't mean to. It just happens. It just happens. I hope you recognize that that's true to varying degrees for each of us in life. And I'm talking about things far surpassing accents of others. The more it is that we are around people, the more we tend to pick up how they do things. You may say, well, oh, no, that won't happen to me. I will influence them. I will be salt and light in them. I'll change them. But isn't it interesting how so rarely that ever works out that way? 
Why, why is that? Well, because the life that we're called to as followers of Christ is not at all the path of least resistance. It's the path of greatest difficulty. And when we are choosing to surround ourselves, especially those who are closest to us, surrounding ourselves with those that are headed in the opposite direction, they're taking the easy road. And the more and the more and more that we are around them, the more it is that we tend to follow. It's not that you'll set out to do it. It's not that you'll mean to do it. It will just happen. That's why if it is that you're serious about this whole idea of returning to God, not only is it that there are some ungodly things, but there are some ungodly people that have to go. Some things that have to change. As I've been talking this morning... I'm confident if you've had your mind engaged, there are some things, perhaps some names that have come to mind. With that, I'm going to ask you to do something simple. In your bulletin this morning, there was uh, an insert. It's got a little picture at the bottom. It's got some lines. And on the top, it says this, There is no room in my life for... The question is, if you are serious about returning and staying close to God, there are some things that are in your life right now for which there is no longer any room for. What I want you to do, and I'm going to ask Karen if she would begin to just kind of softly play, but as this goes on, I want you to prayerfully consider what it is that needs to go on that list. For some of you, it may be a habit. It may be a show. It may be that it's the internet. Maybe it is there's a name. And don't put a last name. Just put a, put a first name. But I'll, there's something to be said about actually seeing it in black and white on paper. This needs to change. Now, if you're not serious about this, if you're not interested genuinely in having a walk with God that's real, that's close, and it's personal, disregard everything I've said. This doesn't matter. But if you're serious about it, there's not room for everything. There's some things that need to go. And I want to give you just a moment, maybe to put some stuff on your sheet. You put some stuff on your sheet and you fold it up and nobody's going to see it. Lord, you have the ability to speak to people in ways that I never can and never will be able to. Because you know not just what can be seen from the outside, you know what's going on in the heart. And you are showing people here today some things that need to change. For some, it may be that they need to figure out how to have a relationship with you that's real and personal like Miguel talked about. There's a lot of people who've already crossed that line, but truthfully, they're far from you. You've helped them, especially over the past few weeks, to see that. But for them to come back, for them to get things where they could and should be, you're helping them see in ways that I cannot what needs to go, what relationships need to change. God, as you are making that clear, I pray that you see something clearly from us. And that's a desire, as Josiah was, to be serious about this. It's not a game. This matters. This stuff matters for time and it matters for eternity. I pray, God, that we'll be those that are following your lead during this time of decision. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you.